for Sunday after Christmas Day, Almighty God, who's given us thy only begotten Son, to take up our nature upon him, as at this time to be born of a pure virgin, grant that we, being regenerate, made thy children by adoption and grace, may daily be renewed by thy Holy Spirit, through the same our Lord Jesus Christ, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the same Spirit, ever one God world without end. Amen. For those who are wondering, we're reading the collects of the of the year through. Um, keep them fresh. Also, we're working through the Episcopal Hymnal 1982. Serially. We're up to Lent 152. This is by Gregory the Great. Spare us, O Lord, who now confess our sins and all our wickedness, for the glory of thy name, our weakened souls to health reclaim. Well, we come back at Professor McDermott's, I'm sorry, McCulloch's, Dermot McCulloch's work, All Things Made New, and we started last time. <laughs> he says that the Reformation was like a disastrous car crash with debris all over the place. And it makes the point that the Western Church was not in a terrible state of decay. I'm not sure I agree with that. I follow uh, Charles Hardwick's. The, there were serious, severe problems. Anyways, he, he introduces um, Martin Luther in the profound sense of pessimism about human beings. It's Augustinianism. Uh, he introduced Zwingli and Luther, and now we pick up here on verse page five. I, I will note that there's a lot of the journalists out there that just love this work. Uh, it's the scholars that whose opinions we're interested in. We we think he's one of the he is the man on, on Thomas Cranmer. Uh, Dr. Ashley Null too is. But uh, McCulloch for his more comprehensive look. I wasn't that impressed by a book on Reformation or his history of Christianity. But, uh, in order to be fair, I need to re rework them. So that's on hold right now. We're doing this. This is one of his newer books. Been through it a few times. It's done by Oxford, which is always good. Yeah, 2016. This just came out. The past also catches up with us in unexpected ways and place. Place. I wonder if he's going to use a new word, reformations, plural. Another fascination of reformation year is how far it resembles great squads of culture across the world today. Western Christianity has largely cut the links between church and state so that we now think it odd or inappropriate that monarchs and politicians should interfere in church affairs. But that is not certainly not the case in Islamic cultures, which would contain a much more integrated view of society. Within the Islamic world is a good point. Rulers and monarchs do, do make a difference in religion, and Islamic societies show many analogies with 16th century Europe. This is particularly worth remembering in the United States where there's such a lively debate as to how politics and the Christian churches should mix. It's always difficult to predict which beliefs from the Reformation will suddenly re-emerge. This is interesting. One of the big themes of the Reformation of the 16th and 17th centuries was that the last days predicted in the Bible were to, be, were to happen very soon. This is one of the reasons that the Reformation was such an urgy, blood, urgent, bloody affair, because it was vital to get things right with God before the last days. That is always the right thing to do for every human. We're all going to die. Face the judge. Now large parts of the Christian world once more emphasize the last days. We see this in Africa and Asia, but particularly in the United States. After the 19th century edition of a particular sub-theme, the rapture of the saved, 
last days has come to play a major part in American conservative evangelical Protestantism. There's a mouthful. Affecting world politics. And I, I just wish I could sit down in a diner with the professor for an hour. Just take, let him. I'd sit there with a thousand questions if he'd just sit and answer. Just listen to him. Oh, wouldn't that be wonderful? Because I mean, the guy is just a genius. Yeah, he's got he's got some issues. We got we would have issues personally, ecclesiastically. But put that to the side. I'm talking to him as a historian. I'm talking to a historian. Oh, that'd be fun. That would be just a glorious hour. Affecting world politics again. For a while at the beginning of the 21st century, this theme threatened to become a major motor in foreign policy of the United States. For example, the Christian rights attitude to the Israeli Palestinian question, the powerful link up between the American right, is rooted in a Protestant preoccupation with biblical predictions of the last days, because an essential precondition for Christ's second coming is that the Jews must be converted. So an intimate relation with the Jews is necessary. Okay, we'll skip one, why he brings this in. But equally important is the effect of last day thinking on questions of world environmental change. Christian right, theological topics, last days. I'm gonna skip that paragraph too, sorry. This great cultural divide is all the more strange because modern Western European United States are both societies created by the Enlightenment, the aftermath of the Reformation. The background was a series of religious wars in the 17th century, in particular the very bloody Thirty Years' War, which exhausted European society and led it to the beginnings of a kind of tolerance. Europeans were sickened by the violence and the experience of just how futile it is to kill people in the name of religion was one of the reasons why Europe turned towards the Enlightenment. It makes sense. It's just, they just retired and exhausted. It makes sense. But there were mistakes that were made in that turn. Enlightenment rethinking of old certainties involved a reassessment of what the sacred book is, and it suddenly seemed despicable to persecute people because they read that book in a different way. Many people went to North America just to escape the misery of persecution, including the Church of England, French Huguenots, but now most of their descendants in the United States still go to church while well, most of the later generations in Europe have ceased to do so. Isn't that interesting? Wow, we'll put that in through the grid, Old Testament, New Testament, systematic church history. And what are we to make of the European losses? The both theology, we, we, we would have a claim, because it's not Christian. We follow J. Gresham Mason on that. Liberal theology is not Christianity. American church going may now be showing signs of following a European pattern, yet the long standing and continuing difference is one of the greatest puzzles in the modern history of religion. And it lies at the heart of why Europe and America still find it so difficult to understand each other. Nevertheless, the United States did not invent toleration, and neither did Western Europe. In the 16th century, there were wide areas of toleration in Europe, which we have forgotten about because they were in Eastern Europe, in Poland, Transylvania, Hungary. During the 16th century, there were so many different religions competing in these areas that the rulers decided it would be best advised to exercise a broad tolerance of variety. The statements about toleration, which we take for granted, and tend to associate with the Enlightenment that had already been made in Reformation Poland and Hungary. It is sad that we remember the former Eastern European Principality of Transylvania for Count Dracula, who never existed, rather than as the first Christian polity 
officially to declare that everyone ought to be able to worship God in their own way without interference. The Transylvanian Diet, that is its parliament, spelled out as early as 1568 in a declaration made in the parish church of a town called Torda, a place which should be more of a center of pilgrimage than it is, quote, ministers should everywhere preach and proclaim the gospel according to their understanding of it. And if the community is willing to accept this, good. If not, however, no one should be compelled by force if their spirit is not at peace. But a minister retained whose teaching is pleasing to the community, no one is permitted to threaten, to imprison, or banish anyone because of their teaching, because faith is a gift from God. So what did the Enlightened do to move on and make Europe so different after the Reformation? The wars of the Reformation had been about how to read a book. And the chief importance of the Enlightenment for Christianity was a revelation, revolution in how to read the same book. To use the jargon of my scholarly trade, it was a change in a historical technique, a subjection of all texts, whether or not they claim to have a sacred character, to a new criteria of authenticity in which historical context mattered as never before. Went the brew on this. This was a peculiarly Western phenomenon, and its effect over two centuries has been to polarize Western Christians, Christianity between those who embrace and those who reject enlightenment. This is oversimplification. This polarization has now overshadowed the divisions of the Reformation. It places conservative Roman Catholics and conservative Roman Protestants on the same side of the culture war. In recent decades, that war had been focused particularly on the debates about sexuality. But there could be many other issues if we chose to change the battleground. The overarching issue is one of authority. We arrive at truths as a matter of individual judgment or through deference to authoritative church leaders or to an infallible sacred text. Uh, I've been acutely aware of this new shift of alliances while I have been writing what is gathered here. And I always knew that there was a need to say a lot about how Roman, Roman Catholicism, in order to talk about the Reformation, half my Reformation, Europe's house divided, was about the Counter-Reformation. Yeah, I gotta get that one, I'm sorry and ashamed to say I don't have. Which was just as much a Reformation as anything led by Martin Luther Ulrich Zwingli or John Calvin. Moreover, Counter-Reformation, he uses the term Catholics, and I'm going to substitute either Romanists or Papists, because it uh, allows presumptive legitimacy that I don't grant as a true Catholic. Turn Christianity into a worldwide religion, taking it to America, Asia, and to subtropical Africa. They began their missions well before the Protestants, who had enough on their hands, were carrying out who they were and what they believed, and fighting the Romanists for survival. So the Reformation, Counter-Reformation story ranges, he's a clear writer, to any, he's just a good writer, to the jungles, to South America, the ports of Japan and the kingdoms of Africa. Already in the first decade of the 16th century, there was a son of a king of the Congo in Central Africa who became a bishop of the Roman Church. Again, I'm substituting Roman, Romanist, or Papist. We have not only to remember this story, but also to tell it in both its glory and horror, because soon in Africa and America, Western Christian expansion became tangled up 
with one of the greatest crimes in Western history, the organization of the slave trade across the Atlantic. Good Christians created that trade and sustained it for three centuries, Romanist and Protestant alike. And they were happy to do so because whether Romanist or Protestant, they heard the Bible telling them they could. Up to the late 17th century, no ch Christians challenged the existence of slavery as an institution. If you had taken a straw poll in any Christian gathering before that date, such as from the University Church of St. Mary the Virgin in my own home city of Oxford, and asked whether slavery was evil, not a Christian hand would have gone up to say, yes, it was evil. That's because the predominant voices in the books of the Bible accept slavery as a part of the God-given fabric of the world. Now it is entirely the other way around. Not a single Christian alive, I think, would defend slavery, and so do. And so in this respect, all Christianity is now out of alignment with the Bible. And it's unfair to say the Old Testament if they owned a slave, they'd manumit him in seven years and give him freedom and a chunk of land, a place to live, be treated with dignity and honor. That's how I read the Old Testament. Old Testament, New Testament, Paul did not advocate for social political overthrow. But we see him with Philemon making an example of charity and the request for manumission. I, he, he, we'll just let him talk here because I'm not sure where he's going. This is still the introduction. I'm not sure what the setup is, where he's going. Uh, he, his chapter one is going to be Christianity, the bigger picture. And it's going to take us a while to absorb his great, his super thesis. Um, we want to weigh it. We are the jury. We got a lot of evidence to hear. Um, it's about 350 or so pages. Counter-Reformation is also a vital theme for the present-day church alongside Reformation because for more than 30 years, the Church of Rome has headed, was headed by, sub, by, headed by consciously counter-Reformation popes. He's right. John Paul II, Benedict XVI, big time. Big time trident, guys. The weakness of this variety of Catholicism is that it has continued to regard the Enlightenment as its enemy. And no kidding. And has sought to exclude Romanists who take a different view. Now, under Pope Francis, the atmosphere has suddenly become very different, even if so far little has formally changed. The next few decades are going to be an interesting phase in the life of the Roman Catholic Church. It was already noticeable in the half century after the Second Vatican Council how many Protestant themes were taken up by the Roman Church, the liturgy and vernacular. I remember this. Bible reading, popular hymns in church. Ordinary people encouraged to sing and communion offered in both kinds. The last two popes were unmistakably opposed to much of this and were against the new ways of seeing authority. It was in that sense they led a counter-reformation papacy. Interesting. Their tragedy was that they did not learn the lesson which King Canute tried to teach to his courtiers that you cannot push back the tide of the oceans. In raising expectations, reformers may well find themselves swept away by them. Pope Francis deserves good wishes for trying to ride the tiger. <laughs> Whether or not he succeeds, another reformation may be in prospect within the Roman church. Yet it is unlikely to be another counter-reformation. Eastern Christianities, the churches of Orthodoxy and Oriental Orthodoxy, have something of a walk-on part in any Reformation story. 
there's a simple reason for this, for that, for this. So far, none of them has experienced a reformation. I forget the guy who tried to do it. He was a Archbishop of Constantinople, name eludes me now, studied in Geneva and went to, I think he may have even gone to England, but he got back and tried to, man, he got, they wiped him out. <clears throat> back in the 8th and ninth centuries, many of them were convulsed by an iconoclastic co controversy which hinged on the great issues to reappear in the 16th century Reformation, whether images were a help in worshiping God or a hindrance. But in the case of the Orthodox, the status quo was restored and not partially overthrown as it was in the West in the 16th century. Images came back. It is also very important that the Greek had always heard the Gospels and epistles of Paul in the original Greek, and they still do. The West had translated the New Testament into Latin, and it was a huge shock for scholars when they first experienced the text again in Greek at the end of the 15th century. It's one of the biggest challenge to the Western Latin Church's authority that it had been presenting the New Testament in a language other than its original. Even without Martin Luther, that would have caused a significant upset. The single fact may explain why orthodoxy has never had a reformation. The Greeks say that the Roman Church in 1054 were Protestants, first group of Protestants. That leads to a second observation about Orthodox Christianity. It has not experienced the Enlightenment either. Now in the 21st century, there are strange new experiences to face. As the, they do, Orthodox Christians may benefit from contemplating the Reformation story because they are now encountering the same Enlightenment culture as Protestantism and Romanism without ever having had to experience the Reformation. In an irony of history, orthodoxy was protected from modernity by its enemies. First, because the Ottoman Turks marginalized it when they conquered Byzantine Empire, and because it was cruelly persecuted by Russian communism. In those circumstances, it needed all the courage and spiritual resources to survive and it could not afford the luxury of thinking creatively about the Reformation or Enlightenment. But now orthodoxy has no excuses in confronting the pluralism of, and primacy of choice which characterize the modern West. And the experience is likely to be traumatic. It is depressing watching current events in war Russian orthodoxy the way that the Moscow Patriarch dances to the tune played by Putin and the Kremlin, delighted to have its place back in the limelight, with no sense of the dangers of power. Protestants, Muslims, Jehovah's Witnesses, and are, are all once more facing repression in Russia and other parts of the Soviet Union. Perhaps now Orthodoxy will experience its own reformation, but the omens so far are not good. Are Western Christians all more or less now Protestants? The Reformation has become a central part of the Western legacy for both Europe and the United States. Perhaps the most precious thing the Reformation left as its legacy is something that Martin Luther probably never said. Here I stand, I can do no other. It was actually some years after his death that those words were first written down. But Luther ought to have said them because they sum up a little of what it is like being a Protestant. The idea became the central creed of the Enlightenment, too. In the, in, it was a piece of dogm dogmatic utterances. Every bit as dogmatic as the 17th century dogmaticians. The United States, even the Roman Church, is a church of individualists who make their own decisions. They do not listen to their bishops. 
particularly when the bishops lecture them against the use of artificial con contraception. If you follow Luther's supposed words, you stand alone before your God, before your destiny, or however you want to put it. And ultimately, you do not have the help of a tradition. You find your own matrix. That is the Western privilege dilemma, the terrifying gift of being a part of the Western Enlightenment civilization. Luther already knew that feeling of terror. Curi and I'm not sure what he's arguing here. Um, yeah, we're getting a survey of orthodoxy and a bit on the enlightenment, and reformation, counter-reformation, but what's he getting at? The curious thing is that this emphasis on individual decision contradicts various other hopes and aims which were dear to the reformers. The Reformation tried to be certain about religion. That's not a good sentence. We're going to have to start getting out our acts here. Just like the Roman Church, it wanted a single truth, too simplistic. And its quarrel with Rome was that Rome had distorted the, that truth. There is a tragedy in laying down clear, firm patterns which give people a sense of rootedness and value tragedy huh okay because religious belief is always open to change variety nuance subtlety we'll stick with the old reform dogmaticians thank you Dermot great religious leaders are off very temperamentally inclined to discount subtlety like Mike Curry at 815 <laughs> I don't know if he's got a he's got one word called love he doesn't know, he's incapable. He says, if he said it once, he said it a million times. He never tells you what it is, <laughs> whatever. But God is often just out of reach. Wrong answer, Dirk, Dirk. we're gonna call him Dermot. Luther often talked about a hidden God, very poor again. Most religion has representational quality. It does not provide clear answers, wrong again. It is instructive to see how a certain sort of conservative Protestantism and a certain sort of counter-reformation Catholicism both love the clear answers. Oh, they very often say much the same thing, particularly on the nature of sexuality. Well, I kind of think so. Listen to the late Dr. Ian Paisley and the late Pope John Paul II on the subject of sex a few years back, and there were remarkable similarities, horrors. This is where he's going. He's, he's got, he hated the Church of England for its stand once upon a time about the sinfulness of sodomy. As there are in the case of their admirers, the tradi traditions which in many ways hate each other both chase certain similarities. Well, no kidding. We, we hold the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, the Council of Chalcedon. Of course, we cling to those things older. Those who call themselves religious traditionalists tend to be those who do not know enough about their religious tradition. <sighs> or who have been edited out those parts which they do not like. If you're talking about laymen, of course, you're going to have uneducated laymen all the way around, including amongst the ignoramuses who don't have religion. There's ignorance there, too. Come on, Durr. <laughs> Moreover, their proclaimed tradition too often turns out to be a tradition of saying no Rather than saying yes, this guy's it. He's being idiotic here. We're confessionalists. We confess our faith saying yes to this, yes to that. A proper traditionalism contemplates the whole range of its past. Okay, he's going to tell us what that needs to be. It is happy to say that past Christians and past Christian dogmas were as often wrong as they were right. 
No. Looking at the tangled story of the Christian past, I am not tied to an assumption that my little corner of belief has some innate advantage over any other. Blind belief, belief, unbelief is sure to err, saying the Christian hymn writer William Cowper. Historians are likely to retort that blind belief has a record even more abysmal and that clear-sighted doubt might be the most healthy state of all. That is history's gift to the church. And in a curious top tur topsy-turvy -tur way, it is a gift that we owe to the Protestant Reformation. Let's be grateful for it. I'm not sure what was going on in that long-winded... Did a lot of long talking to get to the last two paragraphs. And we're just going to digest that and call it. That was not his finest hour. Let us pray. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Godspeed.